So, you know, the, uh, the other day I got a message on my phone, uh, and I don't know if, how many of you guys get these kinds of messages, but I got this message on my phone and it said to reboot my phone, or I should reboot my phone because it's been seven days since I reboot my phone. I don't know, do you, does anybody else get these kinds of messages? Oh, <laughs> Don does. <laughs> All right, so, <laughs> so how many of you have rebooted your computer or your smartphone? How many of you reboot it every day? Ah, we have a few people here. How, how many reboot it every week? How many reboot it every month? Oh, I see a lot of every months. Okay, if you haven't rebooted your phone or your computer in the last month, you should go home and do that, okay? <laughs> so so why, do you, why do we have to reboot our computers and why do we have to reboot our phones? So when, when you start running apps on your computer or when you start running apps on your phone, what happens is that CRUD kind of builds up. The apps are imperfect and they start to leave little things behind in your memory and all of a sudden other apps start to stumble over these little things that are in your memory and you start to have all kinds of problems with your phone and your computer. So every so often you have to go and you have to reboot your phone or you have to reboot your computer because your phone's just another computer. And when you do that, it clears out all the CRUD and it clears out your memory and then everything is clean again and then you can start afresh, right? So, well, it's the same with uh, Christian life. As we go through life, the things of this world build up in us and, and it builds up in our lives and it starts to clutter our lives and it's just like your computer memory. So every so often we need to reboot our minds and we need to reboot our lives and just kind of clear everything out and start things fresh again. Now, sometimes God forces you to reboot. So just like sometimes you know, your computer crashes, you, know, you get the blue screen or you get the black screen, whatever you get on your computer, when it crashes, you're forced to reboot. You have to power cycle your computer and then you have to turn everything on and everything starts fresh. Uh, but sometimes we just need to reboot things ourselves and clear out, clear out all that crud and uh, start things fresh again. So some of you know that uh, God recently forced me to reboot. So, because um, my system crashed, two weeks ago I was in the emergency room and uh, for a heart problem. Now I could tell something was wrong because this was not the first time and things were so severe and they felt so bad that uh, the night before I sat down at the computer and I wrote down all my passwords and I wrote down all my accounts and I gave them the quan because I didn't know what was going to really happen to me. Uh, but throughout all this stuff that was going on, I really had a peace. And uh, I had a peace about what God would have in store for me. And uh, in the weeks before I went to the hospital, uh, I happened to be reading First Peter. Uh, chapter 1 talks about hope. And what I want to share with you today is about rebooting your hope. Okay, rebooting your hope. So on this earth, we have a tendency to put our hope in all kinds of things. We put our hope in friends, in family, in finances. We put our hope in our abilities and strengths. And sometimes we put our hope in our own health. Uh, but First Peter says to put our hope in the salvation we have through Christ. This is the hope that we should look forward to and rejoice in. Uh, let me read for you from First Peter 1. Uh, and, and as I read, I want you to pay attention to uh, the hope you have as a believer in Christ and pay attention to where you should get your joy, okay? So listen and hear what it says about your hope and your joy. So 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Keep in heaven for you, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes even though refined by fire 
may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And then verse 13 says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. This last verse says, set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. The Bible says to set our hope fully on the grace of God and the salvation of our souls. And when we do this, even though all the worldly things fail us, it doesn't matter. When we can still rejoice in God and in the grace and the salvation that he's given to us. So by resetting and by rebooting our hope in God, our perspective changes. Everything we think is important is no longer important. And we can trust God for all the things that are going on in our lives. And you can trust him through all your trials, and you can trust him in the emergency room, and you can trust him in everything. So what I want to say is let's reboot our hope today, and let's full, put our hope fully in God because that's where it belongs. So let me just pray and thank God for that. Lord God, we uh, just thank you so much that uh, we can trust in you and that we can put our hope in you and that you love us so much that we know that all the things that are going on are uh, not as important as uh, who you are and how much you love us. And we just thank you for that. I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. See? And then, as you're also hearing, you know, more and more, we, we are asking our, oh, actually our elders are asking to have opportunity to really be more of a spiritual leader in this church. And I'm excited about that. I think it's a great development. And today, not only have we hear from Ron Lee, who uh, is one of our elders, but we're hearing from Casey, who is uh, speaking to us today. And he also speaks once a month to our youth on the first Sunday of the month. So he's actually uh, speaking today and then next Sunday to you. So here's our um, up-and-coming preacher. All right, Casey. You guys hear me? You know, I've done a couple of announcements and everything and use the handheld and it's no problem. And then you put this thing on, it's like the whole world's changing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is kind of nerve-wracking. I've never spoken in front of adults like this, other than like a testimony. Um, so it is, it is, you know, I was thinking the whole time throughout. You know, we speak all the time. I speak at work. I speak at, you know, I do uh, lectures at colleges. This, this is a little different. Um, so if you guys don't know who I am, I'm Casey. Jess is my wife. He has no Jess because she's always up there. I'm always in back. A um, little, little bit about me. Um, I'm a construction project manager. So... Uh, I am pretty far away from what I would call a normal Christian job, if you know, catch my drift, of what type of people I'm around all the time at a construction site. Um, so it's always a little hard for me to uh, balance both worlds, full admission. But um, hopefully with today, um, kind of sharing my story, it'll, uh, um, it's good, it'll, you guys will learn something, but it was also very good for me. This, this week was actually, and I don't know if it was spiritual warfare or what, this was probably the hardest week of my life from a career standpoint. Um, a lot of stress, a lot of stuff going down at work. Um, I think I got home like after 9 o'clock, like three nights this week, and I was in at 5.30 in the morning. Um, one of them I actually left at 2 in the morning to go to L.A., and I got home about 9. Um, really hard, really hard week, a lot of stress. And part of me thinks that all these, mess, all these lessons that I, I talked about that I was preparing for today's sermon— God was trying to remind me, like, hey, don't be a hypocrite. You've got you to gotta, you gotta do this, too. Um, and I failed miserably many times this week, but it was a good reminder. Um, so if you don't mind, I'm going to start out in a word of prayer. God, thank you for today, and we thank you for life lessons. Thank you uh, for the trials you put us through, and we thank you for the joys that you give us. Um, speak through my life and speak through what you've um, had me plan for today. And may we, just have, like, um, may we just be able to learn something and be reminded of something through this. Um, we thank you for today, and we pray. Amen. So like I said, I'm not a preacher. 
I'm not, you know, other than I speak to the youth kids, but I mean, I'm like kind of close to their age, so I can kind of relate. Um, closer than many of you guys, at least. Uh, <laughs> um, and I don't, I don't have an MDiv. I, I am Christian school schooling. I didn't even grow up in the church. Um, I can't do dissertations, right? If you tell, give me a Bible verse and tell, uh, passage and tell me what's the Greek and what's all this stuff, I can't do any of that. And I'm sure many of you can't either. And so if you take anything away from today, um, I want you to take this away. You're going to hear a lot about my life and what God has taught me through my life and verses and everything that have, have affected me through my so far 30-year journey. I can hear my entire 30-year journey, but bits and pieces of it. And what I want you to take away is all of you have that exact same thing. Right? You guys all have a life. You guys all have a story, highs and lows, and, and lessons that God has taught you, whether voluntarily or not. Um, and one day, I hope that you guys can stand up, whether it's in front of a church, in front of a group of non-Christians, or with your family, friends, coworkers who don't know God, and share that same story the same way I'm sharing it to you today. It might, not, it might be a different story. It might be different lessons. But that story, that testimony is going to be unique to you. Right? And that's something that God has taught you, no one can take it away, and no one can refute it, right? In this world, right, with all the politics and Trump this and Hillary that and life this and abortion that, we've learned, and I think Anthony did a great job speaking on it, that the world wants to skew stories, right? They want to change the narrative. Well, no one can take your own life away from you. That is your narrative no one else can dispute. So that's how I ho- what I hope you guys take away from this. Um, and I apologize in advance to you. I don't do PowerPoint really well. I'm a free flow thinker. Um, so even if I did a PowerPoint, Joe would be back there trying to click around, trying to figure out where he's going. So uh, I apologize for those of you who do normal notes. I know Jess does that. So uh, just follow along with me. Um, so there's a life story. There's one slide up there, and it's the verse of my life story. Um, and I don't think I've ever even told Jess this. It's 1 Samuel 16:7. All right. it's, it's about David. It says, The Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. It's my life verse because when I was down in my dumps, which at that time was high school, so it was just emo, um, that was a verse that, that popped up. That was a light bulb that clicked. Um, and not only did I learn from it, but it's funny because in the future it caused me to rebel in my own way. And you'll kind of hear that. So my story. I didn't grow up in a traditional church setting, right? When I was a little kid, you know, I actually, if you want to know what I looked like, I looked exactly like Kenzie. Pull up my baby pictures. We're twins. Um, For whatever reason, my parents, non-Christian family, sent me to a Christian preschool. It was this uh, preschool down the street, um, and that's where I went. Three, four years old preschool. Then, you know, they asked, where do you go to school after this? So they sent me to the follow-on school, which is a Christian K-8 through school. Uh, in St. Gabriel, uh, up in L.A. So I did the K through 8 thing, all Christian school, right? And if you guys know anything about Christian schools, right, it's like normal school, except you have Bible class, and you can, and everything's centered around that, right? And in Bible class, what do you do? You learn stories, just like Sunday school. You're tested on Bible memory verses. You're testing your knowledge of who was in what story, and what they said, and what they did, and it's a lot of good knowledge. So that's where a lot of my uh, head knowledge came from, from Christianity. I did not go to church. I didn't do anything Christian other than that Bible class, right? No youth group, no mentors. Um, the only mentor I could think of was I followed that K-8 through class, and I went to a Christian high school. Same thing. My parents wanted me to go, and I had one mentor there who was our ASB director, and he was a history teacher, and he would, we would have lunch together, and we'd talk about life, but that was it. Nothing outside of life. It wasn't like we went and got coffee, Back then, coffee actually wasn't was even that cool. Um, and so that was, that was the extent of my Christian um, upbringing, we'll say. We'll say. Um, all, I, all I saw from Christianity was between the hours of 7.30 in the morning and 3.30 in the afternoon. At that point, off, you know, sitting in traffic for two hours on the way home. Um, so not knowing anything like that, um, I picked up some habits, right? Christianity, and if you were going to be Christian, which— I was. I accepted Christ at, in third grade. Prayed the prayer. Didn't want to go to hell. Nothing else changed. I was, I was eight years old, right? Um, even as I got older, you start learning. What do good Christians do? So I read the Bible. I prayed before meals, after meals, on my own. You know, I didn't cuss until I was older. Um, you know, and some of this other, st- all these good habits that we built, um, I did. 
Christians look this way, they dress this way, they talk this way. So if I want to be a good Christian, I should follow that example because that's all I knew. So that's what I did. Um, how many of you guys have seen the movie? Have you guys seen the movie Saved? Anybody heard of that movie? It's kind of when I was in high school. It's a parody on Christian uh, schools. Mandy Moore's in it. Uh, if you ever watch it, I find it hilarious. You probably won't because you guys didn't grow up in the Christian school, but it's spot on on some of the stereotypes. You know, one of the stories I remember is, you know, Mandy Moore is part of this uh, clique, the Christian clique, so the cool girls. And then during their little worship leader, so they're raising their hands, singing worship, and then they get called out, and she throws a Bible at them, and the, the key line is she goes, I am full of God's love, and throws a Bible and smacks them in the face. Just because that's what you, you know, that's what you, that's what you think. You, you put all this on, um, but you've never changed. So I'm going to fast forward all the way, because this is where it matters, in high school. At a Christian high school, part of ASB is a chaplain position. There's four people, two girls, two guys. Um, and what they do is they plan chapels. Chapels are church services, um, we, they, they plan speakers, they lead the worship, they do all that stuff. And the people who select it are the faculty and the previous year's chaplains. So we're going through all that, um, and I'm, I'm doing my thing. I'm raising my hands now. I'm in high school. I'm raising my hands in worship. I'm up there giving my testimony during worship. I'm going on mission trips. I'm doing all this stuff that I should be doing, all good things. And my senior year, they say, or the summer before, because they got selected before the senior year starts, they say, hey, Casey, we want, to, we want you to be one of the chaplains. So, of course, I'm like, yeah, that's like the pinnacle of Christianity. Um, so I, I accept it. I'm one of these chaplains. I'm going to be planning chapels. I'm going to be leading worship. I'm not, well, not singing because I can't sing, but you get it. I'm planning worship leaders, and I'm out there, and we're doing our thing. And now I look back, and I know, and I, I figured that out then. Nothing's changed, right? I'm doing all these good actions, all good things, all things that Christians should do and we all should be doing. But I still never read the Bible at night. I didn't pray. I didn't repent. My life didn't change, other than the fact that I did a lot of very good Christian things. Suffice to say, when I got to college and there was no regiment, there was no schedule, there was no Bible class, I stopped going to church, right? right? I mean, you're in, you're in college. What do you do at night? I don't want to go to church. I didn't want to wake up in the morning and go to class. That's not what we did. Um, luckily, I had some people pull me out of it. One of the people you know, John Liu, but that's, you know, that's beside the point. The point is, is I did not develop the proper habits. And it's not even the habits. I did, not, I did not develop the proper heart. You see, through life growing up, um, I became a Christian where I, want, where I needed to be, and I was not a Christian where I didn't need to be. I was a Christian at school. I was not at home. Uh, it fit neatly into my schedule. When I finished my homework, which was reading the Bible, uh, I was done. I did my Christian duty. Nowadays, it's like listening to a sermon on your way to work and everything else. Check. My work is done. I move on. Those habits for me are very hard to break. So this is where I'll do a quick tangent. Eight years ago, when me and Jess were deciding where to go to a church, we decided on a church called CBC. We were there for two weeks before we found out we were doing a church plant. Um, but, but it was either that or the flood. That was our two decisions. That's where Jess was going and I was going to CBC. And we decided to stick to this church because we realized we were dating at the time. We had no examples, right? We didn't know what a Christian life looked like and the Christian family looked like. Um, I knew what my family looked like, and Jess knew what hers looked like when her dad passed away early. And so we consciously decided that if we wanted to be true Christians and we really wanted to learn what we were, what we were going to do and how to raise our kids, we needed examples. And so we chose all of you guys. And so we, we picked a church where we can come and see what Christian marriages look like, Christian parents, what Christian parenting looks like. Because this is the important thing, is that I don't want Kenzie and Callan to grow up the same way I did. I don't want them to think that we want them to do certain actions and their heart doesn't change. And all that comes from learning from watching us and watching you guys, watching examples, watching you live life with God permeating through your life. I don't want them to think that we just come to church on Sundays and we blow things off until the following Sunday again. Right? And so we've watched you guys to, to set up habits in our life, in our family, to try to get them to understand that true Christianity is not a religion. It's a day-to-day, hour-by-hour, minute-by-minute relationship with God. Um, so this is where I get into my life lesson. Like I said today, um, I feel like I still have to check off my Christian boxes. Right? So I serve at church. Check. I'm speaking today. Like five checks. Um, I read my Bible this morning. I went to small group. Um, I showed up at church on time. Check, 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 check. Um, I walk out the door, and then what happens? What happens with all of us? I need to go to Costco, and we all know Costco's terrible on Sundays. Um, 
I go home, we cook dinner, we put the kids to bed, maybe I watch a show, I fall asleep, I go to work, I'm really stressed at work. So from 5.30 in the morning until 7 p.m. at night, I'm doing that. I get home, rush, try to eat dinner. Oh my gosh, the kids need to go to bed. Get them ready, go to bed. I fall asleep because I'm tired. Go to the gym in the morning, start over. Oh no, it's Sunday morning, right? And through that, I have never even thought about God. How many, how many, does that sound familiar to any of you guys? I know that's my, that's my everyday life. So I think about what God says, right? The Bible, in a lot of verses we know, God says, come to me all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest, right? What does that look like? Like, take my yoke uh, upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. That's what God instructs us. That's what God says he will do, right? Even, in, even in, when he's speaking to his disciples, right, in Mark 6, he's telling his disciples, come with me by yourself to a quiet place and get some rest, right? Even Jesus needed to get away from the crowd sometimes and step back, so he can find his own time in God. And I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, where, where are we supposed to find time? We're, we're like in corporate America, right? I mean, don't you see the meeting I have to prepare for tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., which is why I'm so stressed? Don't you see that I have a 4 p.m. deadline? I have all these things. God, what, how am I supposed to get everything done that you have put on my life, that you have asked me to do, that you have asked me to accomplish, and yet find an hour, two hours, ten minutes to sit down and read your word, and sit there and pray, God, I don't have time for this, God, right? You're supposed to be helping me. You're supposed to be taking my burden off of me. Right now, it's work. I need to do all this. I'll find time for you later, God. Don't worry about it, right? And of course, we don't. I fall asleep on the couch. I, you know, whatever. It just, it's what happens, right? Or it's, God, fine, I'll give you rest. But dude, if I get fired, it's on you, right? Because I got I, I to gotta do my thing. You put me in this position. So here's the thing. The other verse that I've taken a big thing on, I've preached to the, the, the youth kids this all the time, it's Romans 12. Right? Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. What I've learned is our priorities have to be different from the world. We have to look different. We have to have a different schedule. Um, the world tells us that we need, a, we need to move up the corporate ladder. Right? That we have to get A's. We have to do all our extracurriculars and so we can write good essays and we have good service projects and we do good on our AP tests and we do good on our SATs. Right? For, the, for the adults, it's, you have to put in those long hours because you're paid salary, so you've got to do your things. You want to move up from an engineer to a second level engineer to a project manager to a VP to a corporate because that's the normal progression that you take. Right? We want us to be doctors, engineers, all this stuff. Right? That's what that's what the world teaches us. And a lot of times, we put that same pressure on ourselves. I know I do. And it's not even just our work. We have to keep up with the Joneses. We want a nice car. We want to live in a nice neighborhood because we want to put our kids to the right school. So we work even harder to get the salary to be able to do that. Right? All these world pressures that we put on ourselves that we don't even think about run our lives. But God says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. That's the pattern of this world. God has to come first. All that stuff in this world has to come second, right? And God will take care of it. Right? There's a reason that God, the Bible says that it is easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than a rich man to go to heaven. There's a reason that God says you cannot serve both God and money because they are automatically conflicting. If I want to keep rising up the corporate ladder, I can work more and more and more and more. And in the meantime, ignore my family like I did this week, right? I can ignore my wife like I did this week. I can ignore God like I do week after week after week, right? And I can accomplish a lot of things, but where does that leave me? It's intoxicating, right? It's everything the world teaches us. Movies, TV, right? And we're just, and we're just talking about work and time right now. We're not even talking about self-image. We're not talking about all the other things that the world's trying to get us to remember and think about. See, the only way we stand out in this world, which is what God says, right? God says we have to be the light of this world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. We're supposed to be the ones shining out. All those bumper stickers that said not of this world, right, is the point that we as Christians have to stand out and be different. The only way we could do that is if we actually are different. There's a story that came out this week. Um, I'm a big USC fan. I didn't go to USC. I couldn't afford it. I know a lot of you guys are UCLA fans, so I'm sorry. Um, still listen to what I say. Um, there was a coach there that was there for a long time, and then when Pete Carroll left and went to the Seahawks, he followed him along. His name's Rocky Sito. He's a Japanese-American. 
Uh, he was well known in the, uh, when I did somewhat go to church, and a lot of my friends are part of this thing called GEMS, right? Double ACF, where we went to our college fellowship and where John Luza, the head of right now, is a part of this GEMS, Japanese Evangelical Ministry. Um, Minister's ministry. This, game, this guy, Rocky Sito, is pretty well known in that ministry. He was a student assistant at USC, moved up to become a defensive backs coach, I think he did, all the way up to he became like an assistant head coach of defense at USC, and then when, you, when Pete Carroll went up to the Seahawks, he went with him. So he's been there for four or five years now. So he's pretty up there. All the players speak very highly of him. He's a, he's a strong Christian. Uh, grew up in Southern California as a, um, in, a, in a very strong Christian family. He's even told... Um, Sports reporters, uh, in one of the interviews two years ago, Jesus Christ was better than winning the Super Bowl when they won the Super Bowl two years ago. Uh, this week, he quit football, decided to go into ministry. And so if you're looking at NBC Sports, ESPN Sports Illustrated, they have an article on him. And it's funny the way that they put it. They, said, uh, they say, Rocky Cito leaving um, coaching to pick up the ministry. That's how they put it. Right, but I read a couple of articles about, you know, when he announced it. He announced it right after they lost their playoff game. And he said, for the last 15 years, I felt God has called me. But I wasn't sure why, what I had to do yet. So I, I kept praying, I kept praying. When Pete Carroll left for Seattle, I thought for sure this was the time that God wanted me to leave. And I kept praying, and it wasn't, time, it wasn't the time. This year, he said, it was a time. And this is how he told the ESPN or whatever the or article was. He said, I was thinking about what opportunities I would have in football. And you guys all know in football, right, cutthroat. You work long hours at night. Coaches sleep on the couch. They don't go home to their families. They're in the video room, the film room with the players. Um, and you try to move up, right? Everyone's goal is to be a head coach, right? That's what, all, that's what all coaches do in the NFL. So he says he and his wife sat down, and they went through all the lists of everything that could happen. He was already the head, assistant head coach of the defense in Seattle. And if you guys know anything about the NFL, that's a, that's a big that's a big position in the Seattle Seahawks. And he says, what could I be? I could be, a, I could be a coach. I could be a head coach. I could be a defensive coordinator. I can keep going up. I decided that of all those things, I would rather go and serve God and be a part of the ministry. And so he told the team, I'm quitting. I'm done. I appreciate everything you've taught me. It's life. But God has called me to do something more. And so I, and I leave the football team behind, hopefully better than I found it. And my job is now to go shepherd his flock. Right? That is being different. That is turning down hundreds of thousands of dollars a year with a high-profile job, and I imagine a very fun job, right? To now go and, what, raise, raise money and, and work off of donations, and, you know, I don't know what he's doing yet, but it's a, it's a big life change. It's a big sacrifice, right? When I think of, do not conform to this pattern of this world, to stand out, that's what I think of. So, in the same way, me and Jess have talked about um, how are we going to be different with our kids? How are we going to be different with our family? Watching you guys and learning some really good things. I know one of the decisions that we've talked about um, that's affected my company now is that we said that I will never take a job that requires me to be away from the family and me to be away from Jess. So many of you guys have heard that we're going to do a temporary move to L.A. Um, starting probably in March. We're probably coming back on weekends still, but during the week, we're going to be up in L.A. I'm going to be a project manager on the Rams Stadium. When I was talking to my, my, uh, my company, my company says, you know, everyone does this all the time. We'll get you a you know, one-bedroom studio apartment, uh, furnished, very nice, right by the job, which I don't want to be in Inglewood, so near the job, like by the beach. Um, and we'll, we'll take care of you and come up and do the work and go home. You know, maybe if you want to leave a little early Fridays, go back. And I told them no. I told them if we're going... You're paying for a house so that my family can come with me and go with me as we go. And of course they agreed, but they, you know, my coworkers started asking, why? Like, it's not that bad. Just drive up. I mean, you work long hours anyway. Like, how much do you see him? An hour, two hours a day? It's, it's fine. Just leave early on Fridays. And I told them, no, that's not, you know, I value family. Family is number one. God calls us that we're supposed to be together, that I'm supposed to be the head of the household. And how do I do that when I am over there? And so I told them that that's why we do it, is that we have made a decision for our family, for our marriage, that we will not be separated like that. And so now I'm starting to get questions from coworkers. You know, I was in Vegas for a convention. They were asking me, you know, why would you do this? And I told them, family comes first. If you wanted to force me to go, I'll be very honest with you. I told my VP this, I'll be very honest with you. I would quit. I just wouldn't go. I'll stay in San Diego, and if that burned my bridge, I'll go work for somebody else. 
And obviously they didn't make me do that, but that's the level of importance we placed on it. That's what I told them. And they heard me. They started asking questions. The other rule that we have, um, it's just our rule, is that we want to set it up so that our kids aren't so busy that they're going to have to skip church and skip youth group to do activities. I count on every one of you guys to hold us to that when we get there, because I know how hard it is. Um, but we don't, that is my, one of my big things, because I don't want them to, to think that work when they're older is more important than church and God, because that's what it is for me right now, right? I was taught so much that school is more important, right? The whole Asian parent thing, the whole church school thing, that work is more important, that you got to get to a good college, that you got to do good on grades so you can become an engineer or a doctor, and here I am in construction, right? And, and there's, and it's, no, we need to know that God comes first. Work, school, that can handle itself later. And it's funny, when we were in China, my dad actually introduces me as an engineer, even though I'm a construction manager, because in China, the, the construction job is the lowest of the low, so he doesn't want to use the word construction at all. Um, so back to my life. Um, the mission trip I went on was in Oaxaca, Mexico. Oaxaca, Mexico is like the second southernmost um, state. This is my fun story. Um, I went on this mission trip, never prayed about it, I raised a lot of money because my family is very Catholic, and so they thought, cool, he's going to go do God's thing. So here's like $5,000 and just go. And we covered a bunch of other people's stuff and just, all right, I went. Here's the reason I really went. My best friend was on the trip, and the girl I liked was on the trip. Right, flat out. All right, two and a half weeks with that. Oh, we're good. So on the plane right there, a funny thing happened. Best friend comes up and says, hey, we're dating. The girl I liked and my best friend, Right. <laughs> So I was like, wait, this is a great two and a half weeks, God. This will be fun, right? And so me being high school, I'm emo, right? I'm, I'm like distraught because my life's over. Um, and I remember distinctly, we were out with Wami Wham. I was sitting on a balcony. They were watching a movie. And it really, really weird. I think the movie was like Ransom with Mel Gibson. But I don't know why I remember that. But I'm sitting on this balcony, and it's Mexico, so there's no lights. Stars are everywhere. I'm sitting there, pull out a seat. I'm sitting there looking at the stars because I'm emo. And I'm saying, God, why am I here? First time I've ever prayed. And I was like screaming at God, like in my head, because I didn't want to be the guy screaming off balconies. But in my head, I was screaming, right? God, why am I here? Why are you doing this to me? Why am I sitting here in this miserable two and a half weeks? And I had a book. It was a book by Chuck, Chuck Swindoll. It was a, um, a study on the life of David. And that was the first verse that popped up. It says, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I rejected him. The Lord does not look at those things. He looks, he looks at the heart. And I realized at that point, that everything I was doing was just actions. I was so consumed with just having a Christian appearance because I equaled that to being a good Christian that I had never had my heart changed, that I didn't do anything for God, that my life with God didn't even matter. He never even factored into the, into the equation. So, of course, I'm sitting there like, okay, so now what, right? If you guys remember the, if you guys remember the study of, the, of what happens during that time, right? Samuel's coming in. He goes to Jesse. Because right, God tells him that the next king of Israel is going to come from here. The guy will succeed Saul. So Jesse gets all his sons, and he lines them all up, and, he go, and Samuel goes down the line. Oh, this guy, and I'm going to butcher these names because I am not, you know, biblically educated. And this guy is, I think the first guy's name is Abinadab. Or Abinadab, whatever his name is, right? He's there. Big guy, tall guy, strong guy, warrior. Samuel goes, this must be the guy. And God's telling him, no, no, no. Move down the line. So he goes down. The next guy is Sham, Shama, Shama. His name, right? Boy number two. This guy must be it. Looks the same way. Big, he looks like a king. It's not him. Keep going down the line. He goes all the way down the line, if you guys remember, and he gets to the end, and Sam, God kept telling him, no, 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 to the point where Samuel asked, God, asked Jesse, is this it? Do you have any more kids? Right? And Jesse himself, the dad himself, thinks, well, yeah, I got one more. He's this little puny runt that's out shepherding their sheep. Right? Well, Samuel says, go get him. Right? I, I haven't seen him. So they bring him up, and God tells him, that's the one. That's David. He's going to be the next king. And so Samuel anoints him. Right? I was so consumed with being what I needed to be to look Christian. I wanted to be this big warrior king, strong, looking the part that everyone thought would deliver them. And in reality, God just cares about none of that. He wants a person with a, with a heart, and that was David out in the fields, writing psalms, pleading with God. Not perfect by any means. That's why I love the story of David, right? We all know his shortcomings, but God was still able to use him, right? And he's, he was, he was going to be in the lineage of, De of uh, Jesus, right? And even Jesus did not look the part, and the Jews rejected him, right? That's the irony of it, 
right? We spend so much time looking the part that we forget that God just wants us to be obedient. Forget how we look. It's human nature, of course, right? We always, we're taught that um, our successes, our accomplishments is what we find value in. And God does not care about that. Yes, he wants us to do good things, but he wants obedience, right? And those things will come. So ironically, in college, right, and you guys, uh, no one here knew me in college. That's a good thing. Um, I went the other way, right? I was like, oh, I am so going to not look Christian. So I got, you know, I got my ears pierced. I wanted to be, a t- I was wearing a hoodie because I was, again, emo, just a different kind of emo now. Um, and I wanted, you know, I wanted to get tattoos and all this other stuff. And I had, and I played pickup basketball every day. And my big thing was, I look like these guys, the guys playing pickup basketball and skipping church. I'm not even going to church because I want to be with these guys and do it this way. And they want, and I'm going to act a certain way so they know I'm different. But I want to make sure they understand that I fit in here, that I am not a polo shirt, khaki wearing, um, with dress, you know, with uh, ked shoes and you know whatever my uniform was in high school because that to me was what Christians look like, very clean cut spoke Christianese, did all these things. So I rebelled against that. Right now I'm somewhere in between, I, I like to think. You know, like khakis and nice shoes, but I'm still here. Um, so, so that's, ironically, that's the way I rebelled. And other stories for other days, God has, you know, through multiple knee surgeries, taught me there as well. Um, but my big thing was I didn't want to be what I call, this is a term I've always taught all the youth kids, my, a cookie-cutter Christian, right? I didn't want to look the part just to look the part. I wanted to be genuine. I wanted to know that it's okay to have tattoos and dreads and glasses and everything else because it's not about how you look. It's about what kind of representation you are and how God has changed your heart. So why do I bring this all up? You know, a lot of you guys know that we were uh, selling our house for a little while and it didn't, didn't quite work out uh, the way we planned. God took us on another journey. Again, another story for another day. But the real estate we were working with— um, told us a story about Forest Ranch, right? Because we were asking him, hey, where do you, what are your big family neighborhoods? That's what we were looking for, family neighborhood. You know, there's Escondido, San Marcos, all these different places. What about Forest Ranch? We can't afford it, but, you know, we have a lot of people who live here. What do you think? And that agent says, I steer all my clients away from Forest Ranch. And so we're sitting there like, why? You know, why would you, why would you do that? This is why you use a handheld mic. Um, you know, why would you do that? And he goes, there's such a, a big temptation of keeping up with the Joneses. He said, I would never recommend this neighborhood because you, you don't, uh, you don't understand it until you get there. How many clients that I have, which he's talking, so he has, that have come up to him and says, hey, I need to sell my house. Well, you've only been here for two years. What's going on? We just can't afford it. And he's looking and he's meeting at the house. He's looking at the driveway and they have a Land Rover, a Model S, Tesla, a Mercedes Benz. He, He goes, sell the cars. Like, what are you doing? No, 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 we, we can't drive a Honda in this neighborhood. Like, we, we can't do that. We got, we, got to keep, we got to keep this up. We, I'd rather just sell. I'd rather, I got to move out of the neighborhood first. We, got to, we, this, we, have, we can't do it. it. It'd be too embarrassing. Right? And he says, you don't know how many people struggle with that here. So that's a bubble that us as a church, the bubble as us as a community is trying to pop. People that think that way, that think that I have to meet this standard in this world that this community, that this school district, that this city, this country has set. How do we get through to them and teach them that there's more than our smartphones, our nice cars, our calendars, our schedules, our jobs, our appointment reminders, right? I mean, we, we want to follow this life to the T. I mean, I get, I get notifications on my phone like, hey, you hopped in the car. You're probably going to work right now. It's take you 22 minutes. That's scary. My phone knows my life more than I do. Um, but that's the life we live right now. And so circling back to where we started, how do we take that? How do we take that story that God's given all of us and bring it into this community? How do we teach them that there's another way, that there's other priorities, that life doesn't have to be that stressful and that shameful and that tough and that much pressure trying to keep up with everything? The biggest thing I talk to the youth kids, every youth kid, every youth kid that I've talked to, every, every time I speak, every uh, generation that I've talked to, um, from when we started back when I think uh, Jesse Chen was, I think, eighth grade, um, is that God has made you guys each uniquely you. All right? God's made me uniquely me. He gave you talents, interests, you know, allergies, all these things for you. And not just that, but he, then he put you through a life journey. 
right? So some of you went to the military. Some of you went to school. Some of you had to drop out of school because you had to take care of a sick parent, right? Some of you never went to school, and you're an uneducated white person, you know, if you guys know what that means. Um, so all these things, all these different journeys God's brought you through, so you have learned all these life lessons, and then he plopped you into this church, and you plopped you into your communities. And there's a reason for that, right? God gave you through all that because there's somebody there, someone in your community, your coworker, your family, all that stuff that he wants you to talk to, that he wants you to minister to, that that story, your story, the story I'm telling you now, is going to resonate with somebody, right? And God's just calling you to share, to go tell them, to go preach, to be bold. I know for me, I'm very rarely bold in that aspect. And that's one of the things that has to change. A lot of times we look for avenues to do it, right? In this PC culture, we can't just go out and start blurting things. We'll get fired. And I get that. I, I get how hard it is sometimes. So sometimes we've got to find avenues. Well, how do we find those avenues? How do we get into that crack? Well, to me, that crack is being different, right? Because I need somebody to ask me, to come talk to me, so I can go talk to them. Hey, what, what is it about you? Why are you making the sacrifice? Or you build a relationship with them so you can go talk to them direct. Go have lunch. Go do something else. But the, quest, but the question is, how do we do that? How do you even have that type of testimony to be able to have that conversation, to be asked that question, so that when you take them out to lunch and you have that conversation, they're not looking at you like, yeah, I don't believe that in you. Um, if we want to break through and do that, I, I guess you have, it's, it's all about gen being genuine. It's about being that light. It's about being different. All those things we talk about, the example of Rocky Cito that I just told you, right? Having different priorities, doing different things with your kids, right? Not cussing, right? In my, in my environment, with, uh, in the construction world, it's as simple as not oogling at women because that's what happens day in and day out all the time, right? Not cussing because every other word out of a construction site is a cuss word. All those things make me stand out. But that's not good enough. Then you have to have the boldness to share that story, Right? And that's why I wanted to, when I started at the beginning, I wanted to say, you know, if you take nothing else, take that. I had a story, and I'm sharing it with you. And I share it with people out there that I play basketball with, or I used to play basketball with, um, that, I, that I work with, that, you know, um, my family, right? Stories that I share, and sometimes I'm scared to share, I encourage you to also share, to tell your story, because that's going to make a difference to somebody. I think of the verse in Esther, you know, when Mordecai, her uncle, is pleading with her to get involved, right? She had, she had an avenue to the king, and he says, For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance of the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And, you know, and who knows that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Right? And we take that, that verse out of context a lot, I know, and there's a lot of other stuff that goes with it. But it's a very good question, right? How do we know that you have been plopped in your current position for such a time as this, for your coworker who's struggling, for that uh, friend who's getting a divorce, for all these things for you to make an impact. I remember a year ago when, um, uh, when Jeff was speaking and he spoke about divorce, right? And he's very open and honest about what divorce was, and there are many people in the room who had been through a divorce. And I remember talking to those people and how much of an impact that had on them, right? And how much guilt that it took out of them that we know that I've been through this. Um, and God can still work through me because that was the point of the message, right? You never know what the message is and what the message will do. God just calls us to say it, to preach it, to stand out and be different um, and to, to not be fearful and to be bold. Um, that really was the lesson of my journey, right? My journey of putting all my own priorities first, right? Getting A's, being on a regimen, doing all these things, and then... And then not just that, but then trying to also get an A in Christianity by doing all these activities, right? By being a Bible study leader, by being a small group leader, by preaching, by reading my Bible, and doing all these things. There's no grades in Christianity, right? It's pass, no pass. You're going to fail sometimes, and you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna do well sometimes. But it's about putting the focus on your heart. And the ironic thing is, is if I put my focus on my heart, which is what I try to do by the end of this week, all right, that stuff kind of doesn't matter. You can ask just how stressed I was this week. I mean, I would come home, and I wouldn't talk, and I just, I'm going to bed. I, I had migraines. It was bad, right? And it took till Friday night to sit down, and I actually re-looked at this. I was like, okay. You should, I sat on the bed, took a couple deep breaths. I'm going to bed. Saturday morning, I was good. I was reminded, 
right? What's important? God's important, right? Having Kenzie wake up and come through and hug me is important. Having Callan crawl up and drool on me is important, right? Spending, spending time with Jess and then having family and we had Chinese New Year this weekend, that's important, right? Speaking here and sharing my message, that was important. That lot of stuff will take care of itself, right? But it took me having the most stressful week in my life from a work perspective and then, and then ironically sitting down and reading this to realize that. So I encourage you guys to put God first, but mostly I encourage you guys to think about what that story is and write it out. I have notes in my iPhone. Every time something happens, I write, I write down what I learned from it because I never know when I can use that as a sermon illustration for the kids. All right. So I encourage you guys to think about, think back all your years, right? Some, some is 15 years. Some is a little bit more than that. Right? And go through and think about what God has done for you and think about those stories and share those stories and make sure not to leave God out of it. Don't sanitize it because you never know what God's going to do. Let's pray.